All right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the 223rd regular monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight we have Tejun Hio, TJ, uh, who will be giving a talk on resource control at Facebook. Um, first, I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for continuing to provide this lovely space. And thank you to everyone here tonight for joining us. Um, our host, Two Sigma, is hiring. Uh, you can speak to the folks in the back there uh, if you're on the market. They're looking for Linux system engineers, as usual. Uh, Dave in the back, Pavel, who helps us out, helps us organize this. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Uh, please silence all your cell phones, mobile phones, uh, devices. Uh, please do not eat any snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Uh, as usual, we will be recording tonight's meeting uh, and posting it on our YouTube channel within a few weeks, uh, and you can find a link to the meetup, to the recording in the meetup.com comments. Uh, please save questions for the end, and if you have a question, please use the microphone in the middle so that you can be heard on the recording. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of our sponsors, past and present, including Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, the Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support as well as all of our many volunteers uh, who we would not be able to function without over the many years. Um, for Linux workshops, uh, please talk to Simo or Hannah. I didn't see Hannah yet, but I think Simo's here. There you go. And, sorry, sorry, and Greg. Uh, they're happening at the NYU Silver Building, room 512, 32 Waverly Place. The next one will be next Tuesday, January 22nd from 7 to 9 p.m., and that is also on the Meetup page. The next general meeting will be Tuesday, February 12th. Uh, Armin Dagar, I'm gonna butcher that, I already did, uh, will be giving us an introduction to HashiCorp Vault. Uh, and on March 19th, uh, Paul Zuchowski, I have no idea, uh, will talk to us about using ZFS on Linux. Check the meetup page for those. RSVPs should open about two weeks before each event goes live. Uh, after the presentation, we'll be heading to the Cupping Room Cafe 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here. There'll be a nice little caravan. Um, final reminders, silence your phones, put away loud wrappers. We're recording this, use the mics at the end. Uh, now to introduce our speaker, Tejun Hio has been working on the Linux kernel for over 15 years across various subsystems from device drivers to core in infrastructures. Since 2011, he has been maintaining C Group, the Linux kernel resource control subsystem, and for the past five years has worked on C Group 2 to solve the previous version's fundamental shortcomings. Uh, he wrote that, not me, but it's nice when people can admit their mistakes. Uh, Tejun currently leads resource control efforts at Facebook. Please welcome Tejun Hio, giving us resource control at Facebook. Thank you. Um, so I'm Tejun. I'm a software engineer at resource control, although I don't develop much lately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about uh, resource control at Facebook. Um, and I want to um, start with this graph. Um, so um, like imagine a web server, right? Um, I mean, it can be any kind of web server. But uh, you have a, a web server which is serving your clients. And it's usually really busy, right? Um, and then also your web server is busy to the point all its resources are kind of saturated, right? It doesn't have, it's using most of its CPU. Its memory is mostly used. You know, it's also using a lot of its I.O., uh, its disk. Um, and then, like, imagine, like, if you, like, think about a, a web server in a modern fleet, right, there's a lot of things which are running uh, in addition to the main web server, right? I mean, you, you might run Sharp, Puppet, whatever, to maintain your fleet integrity, you know. Yum has to run once in a while to update the packages and all those things. Um, a lot of cron jobs. Um, and like a lot of this like a uh, uh, management software, like imagine one of them has a bug, right? Somebody wrote a script and you know, this is a bad script and um, it ended up consuming a lot of memory or like Python had a bug, there was a bug in library. Um, what would happen then? Um, okay, um, so let's say this is a, a request per second, right? I mean, so this is a web server serving traffic and it's kind of topping out here, like the, like 650 requests per second, and the machine is fully loaded, serving all the clients. And here, let's say, uh, like one of the management software ha uh, started having a memory leak. So fairly, I mean, it's not too slow, but you know, not too fast either. 10 megabytes per second, just steadily growing. What would happen, right? Um, 
um, like the memory eventually would run out, and the, because the system has no memory anymore, um, so the main workload would start thrashing, right? It needs memory to run, but it doesn't have memory, so it has to lose its memory, uh, and then it has to fetch it again from disk. Disk is slow, so everything kind of slows down. And then tries to recover a bit, but then goes down. And the system kind of checks out, right? I mean, now the system is heavily thrashing, and um, it thinks that uh, it's making full progress, but not much, and it's really not doing anything. And eventually, this, this web server got rebooted here, and then the traffic is recovering. Um, now imagine, right, you have like a large fleet of web servers, and because you're managing them with like automation tools, that you have a bug which is happening at the same time on a lot of those machines, right? If this happens, right, your site is going down, right? Nobody's gonna be happy, people are getting paged. Um, so that's the baseline, right? This, this is our web server. We started a memory leak in management part of the um, the server, and it went down. Took like 40 minutes to recover. Now, um, if you look at the green graph, um, it's the same situation, right? Um, it's going up. It's just serving traffic, and then memory leaks get started here, but it dips a little bit, right? Boop, and then it goes back up again. Um, it recovers fully here, it's fully recovered at this point. So we start another memory leak, and goes down a little bit, and it fully recovers, and then you know, the same thing. So we, we did the same memory leak three times, and each time the machine recovered after like a, well, well I mean, a little bit of dip, right? This is not a catastrophe, right? I mean, even if this happens, um, you know, the service to your users might be a little bit slowed down, but you know, nobody is getting woken up. This is fine. So um, this talk is uh, about coming, uh, going from the purple graph to green graph. Um, and we did that you know, using uh, resource control mechanisms in, in Linux. Um, who here um, has ever heard about C groups? Cool, awesome. Who actually uses it? Cool, all right. All right, um, cool, yeah. That's uh, a lot better than many other audiences. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we are a um, resource control group um, at Facebook, and it's a kind of cross-functional, like multi, like a, different people from different teams work together to make this happen. Um, you know, kernel team, obviously, uh, we try to implement the basic features. Then there's the kernel applications team, uh, operating system, and all the um, actual production tiers, you know, people who are responsible for web servers and all those things. Um, and this is our mission statement work conserving full OS resource isolation. Um, so let's kind of unpack that. What, what does that mean? So work conserving is, well, I mean, if you go back, like resource isolation is kind of okay. Like this understandable, right? Uh, you want to have multiple things in the system and you want to like a slice of resources so that some guys, you, you can control who gets how much, right? That's resource isolation. But what's work, what's work conserving and what's full OS? Um, so work conserving um, means that means that um, you don't lose like if you add up the total amount of work done by the machine, then it doesn't go down. Right? You don't you don't lose capacity to control to have control uh, over resource distribution. Um, basically means that you know we don't want to pay say twenty percent overhead to have resource isolation. We just cannot cannot afford that. It's too expensive. So we want to maintain the total amount of work done while having uh, resource isolation on top. Um, and full OS. So if you imagine like virtual machines, right, they're fairly easy to isolate, right? Um, um, like QME, VML, VML or whatever. Um, you can just kind of set how much CPU each CPU process uses or how much memory is assigned to um, you know, each VM instance. So on and so forth. It's fairly easy, but um, why is that easy? W w w that's easy, right? But if you think about doing that on your own on like PC, right? It's not that easy, right? It's not that clear cut. Um, why is that? I mean, that's because like um, for VM, like each instance that you are controlling are completely separated, right? There's this clear boundary, so like you know, so like distributing resources across them are fairly easy. But inside a single operating system instance, 
That's not the case, right? I mean, page cache is shared, libraries are shared, you know, IO device is contended, right? Um, like, uh, or the page cache is, you know, put on a shared LRU list. So there's a lot of sharing, but also, um, that's what makes it really convenient, right? Um, like talking from like one VM instance to another VM instance, you have to like, talk through um, network interface or whatever, right? On local machine, you have a lot more interactions uh, inside your system. So we want to keep all of that um, and just have resource control laid over working transparently. Um, so full OS means that we don't want you to change, have to change how your application is composed to have resource control. We want to have it just like transparently um, working on top of everything. So, um, so that was our goal, right? Uh, making that work um, was our goal, and um, we kind of like um, started seriously working on it over two years ago. Um, and we thought that we thought that like what would be a good project um, to demonstrate that we achieved this. And while not too complex, still meaningfully useful. Um, so that's where FVTEX2 came in. Um, so FVTEX is the term we internally use um, that, so each server in Facebook fleet has to run and then pay a certain amount of overhead um, to be part of the fleet, right? All the management things, um, you know, security, all those things. And, and those parts are not small. Um, it's not, you know, it's not obviously not majority of the system, but there's still a substantial part of the, um, what the system is doing. So we call that the tax each machine has to pay to be a part of the fleet, right? So that, that part is epi tax. And as I, um, as in the, like the initial graph, right? Sometimes something in the tax part breaks and brings down the system by consuming too much IO, too much memory. Um, so we, we um, so our initial project was that if we can do um, work conserving full OS resource isolation, uh, easy case would be protecting the main workload, web server for example, from the text part, even when they are misbehaving. And um, so that was um, our um, goal, right, our project. Um, and as you can see, there's a two here, right? Um, Meaning that our first attempt was, attempt was a miserable failure. It didn't work at all. So, <laughs> so everything we, we um, work on have like two or three, yeah, <laughs> after that. Um, so why, why, why we ended up with Epitex 2, right? Why, why didn't the original Epitex project fail? Uh, why did it fail? Why, what was difficult? I mean, it doesn't sound that difficult, right? Um, <laughs> but I mean, we found out that um, almost nothing really worked the way that we needed them to. Um, for example, like there's a, if you think about like memory control, right? I mean, if you think about um, controlling how much memory to give to whom, right? An obvious thing to, to do is that limiting, you know, how much somebody can get. So that's what we started with. Um, so what we started with that if you are the text part, you are, if you are not the main workload, you can only use up to a certain gigabytes of memory. That's like our intuitive first thought. That's what we implemented. Um, turned out it didn't work because it is not work conserving. Um, the reason uh, why that doesn't really work is kind of interesting because, because our servers at maximum capacity are nominally oversubscribed, meaning that you know it's not always subs or oversubscribed. I mean that wouldn't work, but at full capacity, right? The system is um, has moments, right? Um, occasional moments where um, at the text part, like the the non workload part, has to borrow some resources from the main workload to maintain um, system stability. And if we put like this um, extra restrictions which are not work conserving, meaning that you know we are reducing the total amount of work um, the system can do by restricting how memory can be used optimally, then that lowers the total efficiency of the system and that actually leads to more brittle or um, more fragile systems. Um, and we found out that really hard way because we deployed that to a lot of machines and found out that it's worse than before, right? What did you do? 
Um, and then we had to roll back everything. Um, so that was kind of sad. Um, and another thing uh, which was broken, or didn't work on, on, in terms of memory control was the um killer. Uh, who here knows what um killer is? Yeah. Who here likes it? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so um killer, um means that out of memory. And so Linux kernel um, allows you to like declare to have more memory. And when you actually try to use more than what's available, I mean, the, then the kernel doesn't really have a lot of options, right? So when memory is too oversubscribed, that the system cannot reasonably make full progress, uh, the kernel would pick something and kill it, so that uh, you know you, you, you can kind of get out of that deadlock situation. And um, the thing with a kernel um killer is that it doesn't really understand uh, whether applications are healthy or not. So the way that it gets triggered is that if the kernel itself cannot make forward progress, um, then it triggers. But if the user space, um, the main workload, say, is stalling for 10 minutes, it's barely running, then the kernel might still keep thinking, oh, it's still fine, it's you know, all, all fine, I'm good. That's what you saw in the first graph, right? I mean, there was the 40 minute period where the machine was not serving traffic, but the kernel didn't do anything, right? The kernel thought that this is fine. So um, that was another challenge we had, right? Um, when we oversubscribe the system, sometimes, you know, kernel um killer just didn't know what to do, even when it should have taken action. And um, IO control. So IO here means um, like local disk IO or SSD IO. Um, we didn't really have a good IO controller to use. Um, a controller is the thing that uh, C group is the C group term for the thing which controls distribution of a specific resource. So memory memory controller worked 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 at the time too. IO we didn't have a good controller to use, um, especially something which works both on SSDs and and uh, hard disks. And uh, also there was um, if you think about like a, a shared file system, right? If you think about a file system. There are two types of BIOS, right? You either you write the extra data, right? You you know the thing that you want to write to, and then there's a lot of things which are metadata, right? I mean the file name, the directory structure, you know what got accessed or modified when. All those things also get recorded, and um, those things are kind of shared, right? Um, I mean it doesn't have to be, but in most file system implementations, um, all those metadata are somehow serialized against each other. So um, you have this uh, strict ordering defined. So you cannot really, you know, uh, say that this metadata IO is yours. So you can like, you cannot really do that. So it's kind of behaves like a shared resource. Um, it's the same for swap IOs. When you um, have a swap partition enabled, and um, when um, the kernel is swapping your uh, malloc memory out, um, you know, it's not clear why that IO is happening. Right? Memory is not sufficient, so that's happening, but it's not you know necessarily clear um, who should own that IO. So and all those things um, were not tracked or charged properly. Um, so, for example, on single one, if you do a lot of um, um, file system metadata and swap IOs, they are all charged to the system, like whatever they may mean, right? Nobody owns that, which is not great if you are trying to isolate um, resources. And um, so, like, we spent like a, about a year um, trying to solve the memory and um, IO isolation problems, and we implemented a brand new IO controller. Um, and we thought that we finally have the right, finally have a solution which works. So earlier last year, um, early last year, we put these things together, like you know, ah, it's gonna work this time, and uh, we found out that it didn't didn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's another failure. Um, <laughs> so that's what we spent like a six months solving. And and we the the, the thing that we encountered was um, like a, a series of uh, priority inversions. So if you think about um, like any modern operating system, really, um, all of them have kind of fairly severe priority inversion issues. But but it's kind of nice because you don't have to worry about it too much. 
let's say you have a low priority stuff, right? And you have high priority stuff. And high priority thing is blocked behind the low priority thing, right? What would happen, right? So high priority thing cannot run, right? Which is priority inversion. But because now the system doesn't have anything else to do, so it will naturally run the low priority thing, unblocking the high priority work, right? So it's just, you don't really have to try too hard to solve these um, priority inversions. If, if, um, if you don't, if you don't put extra restrictions on how resources are distributed. Now, we don't really cannot do that because now if a high priority thing gets blocked behind low priority thing and we are trying to like control resource consumption of a low priority thing really hard, then that natural um, inversion fix is not happening, right? So with um, IO ISO, uh, resource isolation, um, the, the harder or the better we try to do it, priority inversions become a, a more uh, serious problems. So um, the first thing we found was the file system, ext4 uh, serializes, basically end up serializing all writes, um, including data um, through, it's, uh, it's, I heard that it's fixable, but um, it's still not fixed yet. Um, and you know, people are gonna work on it, so it's gonna fix it, but you know, it wasn't working. What happens is that, um, that uh, any right, even if you're, regardless of your priority, um, eventually end up waiting for any right which happened before you. And you know, that just breaks down or, or isolation. And the uh, file system metadata and um, swap IOs, when, you know, if you think about like, a, let's say you, you run a you know, mail server which creates a lot of files, so a lot of metadata IOs, um, then they can just dominate. The system IO can just dominate your disk and then your high priority workload might not be able to do much. The same thing with swap. And MFSM, MFSM is an interesting uh, story. Um, MFSM is something like you, uh, which protects a given processes address space. Like um, so, when you MF, like when you start a process, it builds its own like a uh, address space. So that's protected by this semaphore. And the interesting thing is that when you do PS, right, um, to get the listing of processes on your system, um, that actually has to grab that semaphore to look into the address space of the target, like each process, to read out um, the, the command line and the arguments to show it to you. Meaning that, meaning that um, if a process um, starts doing IOs, like uh, doing disk IOs, while holding its own MFSM, which is okay, right, which makes sense. I mean, it's my address space, I'm gonna hold my semaphore and I'm gonna do IO, right? Then let's say that is a low priority thing. So it gets throttled down a lot. So it takes a, a long time to do that, right? And now some like high priority system management thing tries to run PS. And PS now gets blocked behind that MFSM, right? And now the whole system is just kind of stuck until the low priority thing finishes its IO. So that was something uh, we didn't expect, but yeah, obviously happened. Um, and a bunch of other things. So um, we spent like good eight months solving all those problems. And um, here are the solutions that uh, we arrived at. So uh, memory low and memory min um, is what we use primarily instead of memory that high MX, meaning that we don't try to limit what somebody can have, rather we try to guarantee um, you know, what an important workload should have. Um, and if the important workload is not really using them, then you know low priority things can just kind of borrow them, meaning that it's a lot more work conserving. Um, yeah, and the memory that low is you know best effort. Memory that mean is just a little bit harder, but still kind of best effort. And um, uh, it allows um, configurations. It makes configurations easier because your configuration is, you're not setting hard limits, so you're just kind of saying that this guy is probably important, give it more memory. So this, you can be a little bit wrong and still be okay. And we are trying to make it uh, even a lot more easier um, uh, by making uh, reclaim pressure. So you can basically really ballpark um, 
your uh, memory priority. You, you can basically say that, you know, uh, this is the main workload, uh, you know, up to 16 gigabyte, this guy, you know, can just have it, and above that, you know, this guy should still have, you know, preference. Um, so it kind of becomes really easy to configure. Um, this is mostly worked on by uh, Johannes right there, and uh, Chris Down is now working on the proportional uh, control. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's going to send out the patch pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, another thing that uh, we found out was that it was actually really difficult to tell why a system is slow, right? Like on your laptop or like on your desktop or whatever, right? When, let's say, something is stuttering, something is stalling on your phone, right? How easy is it to tell why that's happening? I have a hard time telling, right? And um, and that's what we kind of realized. So we, we uh, tried to approach this problem of um, like resource isolation, and we realized that it's actually really difficult to tell why something is slower than it should be, right? Is it lacking CPU? Is it lacking I/O? Is it lacking memory? Like, and what what are the contributions of these things? So uh, that's why um, we implemented PSI. Johannes again. It's uh, Johannes's baby. He worked on it for like two years, or maybe three. Um, <laughs> so what it gives you um, is that, um, given a resource for CPU, memory, and I/O, that if this uh, application or workload had a more of this resource it could have run X percentage faster. Like, I mean, you flip that over, what it means is that I've been slowed down because there was not enough memory by 20%, right? So it kind of really gives you that canonical um, slow down factor of each resource. Um, and, and we use this uh, extensively uh, now in our flat. Um, we log it everywhere. And um, whenever like something happens, we look at the pressure metrics. Um, to tell like why it got slowed down, why something is not working. And the really nice thing is that um, this is available for all main uh, major local resources, CPU, memory, and I.O. And it's also available system-wide, so system kind of yeah, the whole system view. And it also is available per C group, you know, going down the hierarchy. So you can really drill down, you know, which part got slowed down and why. Sorry. <clears throat> And it just makes debugging a lot easier, like understanding what's going on a lot easier. Um, so we use this for many things. Uh, just understand your situation, how resource should be uh, set, resource isolation limits should be set, uh, computer should be set. Um, load shedding, right? Uh, if you think about a machine, how are you gonna, like, what's the optimal way to fully load a machine? Like, what's the optimal way of um, um, achieving maximum bandwidth? How, how would you do that, right? It's actually not easy. Like the thing is, um, if you just look at, like, say, CPU utilization, let's say you want to uh, fully load a machine in terms of CPU, right? Where are you going to, like, max out, right? Are you going to reach 100%, right? If you target 100%, right, how do you know, like, whether you are overloading it and just adding extra latency? It's not easy to tell, right? Are you overloading it by 10% or 50%? Right? How would you tell? Um, or if you like load a lower number, then you might be losing out in terms of bandwidth. So uh, load shedding is that, um, so using a uh, pressure metric, what we can do is that we can target slightly positive pressure, meaning that we are fully loading the machine, but not by too much, right? We are only incurring minimum amount, minimal amount of extra latency while keeping the machine fully loaded, right? So you can do things like that, not, not you know, that simplified, but it allows you to do something like that. And one main thing, uh, one, one of the biggest use cases of um, PSI uh, is UMD. UMD2 now, because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we're Facebook. <laughs> Everything we do is, you know, have to after it, right? Um, so, like, what, what PSI gives you um, is understanding of how components of your system is doing, right? How, how different parts of your system, how healthy they are, like how, how, uh, how much starved of resources each part is. Once you have this understanding, um, then you can take a lot more gentler and smarter actions um, when resources are oversubscribed. So what UMD2 does is um, it 
watches PSI metrics across the system in different parts, um, and it decides that, for example, right, um, my main workload seems to be suffering a little bit because my management, my, uh, the text part, is spiking up, is, is generating too much memory pressure that now my main workload is getting affected. Let's find the culprit in the system that slides and just kill that, right? So it can do fairly intelligent uh, decisions and it can trigger a lot faster. Like um, it doesn't have to wait until the kernel decides that nothing is making forward progress. It can take action when um, workload health starts deteriorating so that you can, you, you know, you can take a lot more uh, proactive uh, measures. And uh, UMD2, the main thing about uh, UMD2 is that uh, we wanted something um, a lot more uh, flexible configuration system. Like uh, UMD, the original UMD was a, a bit of a prototype, so we had certain uh, specific um, um, behavior baked into it. And as we expand um, the use of UMD uh, across our fleet, um, we realized that we need something more flexible. So like UMD2 now has like a plugin, you know, and the modular configuration, and it's kind of like IP tables. And I think um, it's now running on like high six-digit number of machines. So it's fairly widely deployed already in our fleet. And it's also open source, so you guys can just kind of check out and use it. And um, so those were the solutions for our memory problems, uh, primarily, right? Uh, memory the low, PSI covers everything, but um, more on memory focus and on um, UMD. And for IO, we implemented a completely new um, IO controller. So uh, f let me ask you this. Um, can you tell like, whether your disk is loaded below or above 30%? Like, I mean, can somebody tell that reliably? What does it mean? <laughs> sure. Like, I mean, so there are um, metrics you can use, and if you use different operating systems like uh, you know Mac OS, Windows, or Windows, uh, Linux, whatever, um, they all use somewhat different metrics. Like Windows uh, primarily use uh, the time the device has been active. Um, I forgot what Mac was doing. Anyways, um, you guys, uh, you can make like these approximations, but it's really not that simple because um, if you think about like any modern hard drives or SSDs, right? These are like uh, queued devices, right? You can throw multiple commands at it and, um, and, and as you throw, if, as you increase your concurrency, you actually get higher bandwidth, right? Up to a certain point. Beyond that, you start getting, you know, just more latency. Um, also, your mixture of IO really matters, right? If you're giving it a, uh, megabytes of reads, sequential reads, it's gonna be really fast, right? If you're giving it like 4K, just random IOs, it can be really slow. And like factoring in these things is kind of really hard. So most, like nobody really has a good metric of how loaded a, uh, an IO device is. Like if, if somebody tells you that, you know, I can tell you what my IO device is 30% loaded, it's usually not true, nobody has it. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the biggest problem of uh, controlling I.O. because you cannot um, measure, you cannot quantify how busy a given or how costly a given I.O. is. It's really difficult to control it in a reasonable way. I mean, you, you cannot tell the price of it, like how are you gonna charge it? So that's the biggest problem. So we kind of sidestep that. Um, so what we instead did um, was targeting I.O. latency. So what you do is that you are important, you are the main workload. If your IO completion latency um, is going above certain level, this is a problem. We are gonna slow down everybody else. So we are gonna guarantee completion latencies instead of other metrics. So completion latency we can measure easily. Uh, this is what we implemented. Um, and uh, it works fairly well, um, fairly work conserving. Um, on works well on hard disk and SSDs. And um, one thing uh, which is developed while implementing this, but um, in the, is also independent of that, is uh, this part, do first pay later. If you remember the metadata in swap IOs where the um, ownership of the IOs are not clear, or rather, um, 
you cannot really slow them down no matter what, because if you slow the, them down, the whole system is going to be slow. Um, so up until recently, we were charging all of that to the system, right? Um, nobody was responsible for it. Now what you do is we still cannot slow them down because that's gonna, you know, mess up the whole system. But we remember like um, why that happened, and we make them pay later. Um, so we don't slow them down. It's like credit card. So I mean, like um, each workload has like this credit balance, and they can spend it. But they they are they will get slowed down afterwards. So that you know it doesn't cause the contention, but they are still held responsible. Um, yes, that's how we solve that problem. And then we fix all the product inversions that that matter to us. Um, BorefS um, has some um, needed some modifications, but um, we could uh, fix that fairly easily because we have um, a lot of BorefS developers, including Chris Mason. Um, so. We kind of switched a large part of our fleet to BottleFS in a really short time frame, because we were mostly based on ext4, and now we are a lot of our fleet is based on BottleFS, and all our container images are BottleFS. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, MFSM um, inversions. Uh, we are now we have a good handle over it. Shared IOS, um, yeah credit system, you know, you do it and they're gonna charge you later. Um, yeah, and all other things. So, um, this is what, like, all those solutions, we implement all those solutions over like a couple of years and um, we put them together. So this is what it looks like, the, the total package of Epitex2. So with BorderFS um, for the file system and um, what happened? Okay, yeah, and also we enable swap, which it was fairly controversial at the beginning, but I don't think it's um, as controversial anymore. But the thing is, that, like, if you there is a reason why people like frown upon swap, right? Who here likes swap? What is swap? Uh, swap is uh, like a um, like a temporary storage space that you can put your memory away. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, like, there's a reason why people hate swap. Like, um, the thing is, um, on hard disk, hard disk is really bad at random IOs because it has to move that, you know, physical head and, you know, it has to wait for this bit, like, the platter to, you know, be in a certain position. Um, and if you do swap out with a lot of things, um, reading them back in generally tends to be really random. So, on, on, if you're on hard disks, it really makes sense to kind of avoid swap, to at least you know, try to use it not as much as your file system. File system is, tends to be a lot more um, sequential. But with SSDs, um, that's really uh, going to, you know, becoming like less and less of a, a case. So there's really no reason to, um, to dislike swap compared to file system um, backed memory. And, and so what, what swap gives us um, is the first of all, it, you know, it just makes better use of memory because you're not unlocking, you're not saying that, you know, this memory cannot be ever moved, right? So you're not saying that anymore. So the system can make more intelligent choices in terms of how to utilize memory. And the second thing is, like, um, like think about a system which has, say, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, right? And you have a main application which uses 15 gigabytes of malloced memory, which has to, which are now file backed. So now the system only have one gigabyte it can play with, right? When your buffer is that slim, it's really easy to go from the system seems fine to we can make any full progress whatsoever because the, the uh, margin is so slim, like the failure mode is really abrupt, right? I mean, you run out of memory. In, in seconds, right? And then you're just kind of messed up. So what SWAP gives us um, is kind of uh, making that, that failure or um, degradation um, of behavior a lot more gradual so that the system just gradually slows down as it runs out of memory rather than you know, just hits a brick wall and just dies, um, which you know, gives a lot more control um, in terms of what you can do about that. 
So um, on hard disk MNIST, uh, we don't enable that for main workload because hard disks are really slow. But you know, for the system management part, it's fine, and that still gives us a lot of buffer. On SSDs, um, you're probably going to be enabling everywhere, but we are not there yet. So um, this is our uh, C group layout um, that we use in Epitext to uh, layout, um, kind of simplified, but host critical contains the things, like this, if these things go down, the system is down, right? So umbi, obviously, you know, is watching over memory overconsumption, so it has to be protected. We want it to be login and debug. You know, we also want to be able to know what happened in the past if something went wrong. So these are, you know, always protected. And they don't use all that much memory, so they have a stronger, small protection, and it also has IO protection. Workload dot slice, um, it contains the web server or whatever the main workload is, and it, you know, consumes a lion's share of memory and has IO protection. Um, doesn't really matter at this part. And system dot slice is what has everything else, right? All the, you know, chef, pop you name it, Chrome, everything else is here. And um, it doesn't, it just means that uh, 75 millisecond means that, you know, compared to this, this is a lot less important. And it, it doesn't have any memory protection, right? It just kind of, it just uses whatever is left over. UMD2, um, this is the, what UMD2 does um, on Epitext2 setup. Um, so uh, if one of the texting is, causing a lot of memory pressure and our main workload is getting slowed down, you know, kill, find that and kill it. Um, it things like that, right? I mean, we just, what, what we're just trying to come up with rules so that we can protect the main workload from misbehaving text part. Um, yeah, and it, it, also if we run out of a swap, you know, find out whoever is using the most amount of swap and kill that, right? The thing is, it's probably leaking memory like crazy, so. And so these are the widgets um, from uh, hard disk based machines, hard, hard disk based web servers. Um, it's the same graph that I showed you um, on the first slide, right? Um, green, uh, kind of fine. Purple is the original, like without FB text to resource control. It just dies, takes like a 40 minutes to recover. And you know, the other one is fine. The one thing which is interesting is that uh, that I didn't explain on the first slide is that like this, uh, these graphs at the bottom. So these are pressure graphs, um, the PSI resource pressure um, graphs. And it's kind of really interesting. Um, if you look at bottom, like the, the case is a little bit cryptic, but um, the, the blue and the red, I think. So the blue um, is the text part of the protected configuration. And the red, which is at the bottom, is the actual main workload, meaning that while all these are going on, the corner is, um, the C group is um, protecting the main workload, so it's not experiencing much memory pressure, resource pressure, while the rest of system, the slow part, like the less important part is experiencing more pressure, right? So it's kind of attenuating, it's uh, isolating resources so that important part gets more. Um, but if you look at these two guys, the orange and green, right? And when the memory leak started, they rise together and then the system dies, right? There's no differentiation between important and unimportant part. So there's a resource control, um, you know, in action. And, and the reason, like the way that it recovers like that, like, um, like, so the reason why it holds out better without dropping like that is, you know, uh, the corner implementing resource control and here is Umdi kicking in. Like Umdi here decides that this is not sustainable. I'm gonna kill something, so, and it kills the memory hole, and that's how the system recovers. Right. Uh, this is uh, basically the same thing, but um, faster memory leak. Uh, just the time scale is compressed. Everything is the same. Right. The purple machine dies, comes back after half an hour. Um, the green machine dips a bit, but survives fine. Um, this is, uh, so the previous two slides were memory protection. This is IO protection. It's not as clean because it's hard disk and hard disk is really slow and we cannot control them too hard because they're just nominally oversubscribed. But you can still see that, um, that, you know, the green one is 
dipping less than the purple one. Um, yeah. Uh, and the same thing with um, so like these are memory pressure graphs, and these are I/O pressures, right? These are I/O pressure, and I/O pressure gets like a uh, attenuated. Um, the important one doesn't experience as much um, pressure from leg of I/O. And those are SS uh, hard disks, and these are uh, these are some um, SSD machines. The same thing, but um, just kind of. Better, right? I mean, it doesn't dip as much because you know SSDs are awesome. Although the SSDs we use are usually not awesome, um, but still better, a lot better than hard disks. Um, so they don't they don't dip as much, and even the like non protected one recovers faster. But you can really see, right? I mean, the attenuation is really clear, like how they they get protected. The same thing with a faster memory leak. Um, now this is fine, right? I mean, like deep of this level, nobody really notices. I mean, people do notice, but it's not not a big problem. So um, that's what we did, um, and um, here are here are the conclusions or possibilities to introduce. Um, so we now have uh, working full OS resource isolation. I mean, it's not perfect, right? I mean, it's not. It's a little bit limited in that. You know um, that that we can protect the main workload from um, um, text part, non unimportant part. But like some of our control mechanisms are still kind of still a little bit crude. If you think about IO latency, right, it's a little bit difficult to configure, right? I mean, is 50 millisecond a good number? Is 30 millisecond a good number? Right, that's kind of finicky, and it's dependent on both. The underlying hardware and the workload and whatever else is going on in the system. This is a little bit difficult to um, implement, uh, configure. Um, but we still, we at least we demonstrated that you know this can work, um, and it's actually useful. We are deploying this, and um, and all features are upstream um, now. I think so. If you download the latest Linux kernel, all of these features are um, that we implemented are there, so you can do the same thing, and. Um, and so that's where we are, and we are now working to address those uh, shortcomings that we we I just said. So uh, we are working on the proportional IO control for uh, complex workload stacking, so that you can really say that you know this guy can get say 60% of IO. And uh, we are, it's still like we are, we are still um, trying to figure out what the best way, and we are trying out really a lot of different things, including like time-based uh, control or like a machine learning based uh, IO load calculation. Um, but I think we are getting fairly close. I'm hoping to um, get something um, working this half. Um, and uh, we're also working on uh, pressure based uh, memory sizing. Johannes is working on it. And it's kind of really cool because um, it's really difficult to tell, right? I mean, like, who here uses container flat platforms like uh, frameworks, right? So these things come with like this resource configs, right? You can set, I want to use X megabytes or X gigabytes. Um, what number do you pick? Right? I mean, you have an application. Like, how do you pick it? I have no idea. Um, and mostly, you know, people just kind of pick random number and see whether it works. And if it works, it works. It doesn't. They try to, you know, kind of change it. And sometimes that works out. Sometimes that's kind of sad. Um, so what we're trying to do um, is. Um, rather than you know setting this magic number like x megabytes or gigabytes, we are trying to say that this is important, right? I mean, this shouldn't experience too much pressure from memory, and the rest, the kernel, you figure out. So we are trying to implement that. Um, we don't know whether this is going to work out, but it'd be really cool if it works out. Um, so that's what they're doing, and um, yeah. And all these things are, if you go to this website, opensource.ap.com slash Linux, um, we have like a, this, like six icons, and if you click through C group two websites, and there's a documentation site, and you know, it documents everything. And Thomas here, um, he worked on uh, all the documentation and websites, so you can ask him. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was my presentation. Um, any questions?
Mike, can you um stand on the yeah? <laughs> Hi, great Hi. presentation, thank you. Um, so different systems have different applications which have different functions, mm. which have different performance profiles. So was, with the charts you were showing, were they for a particular kind of application or were they for like database or web server or, or whatever? So um, the graphs that I showed you are all from web servers. So it's a homo not completely homogeneous, so fairly homogeneous workloads. Uh -huh. And we are applying uh, the similar type of configurations uh, to different uh, workloads. And you know, we, we, are, we just have to uh, adapt that to fit the uh, application profile. Right, okay, all right, just curious, thanks. Yeah. For, for particularly the IO prioritization, has any work been looked at for network-based file systems? Uh, no, 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 I mean, we didn't. I'm sure like somebody has, but uh, we, we really, we didn't. Yeah, sorry. Um, I found your comments on swap to be um, matching what I've seen before too. Um, can you talk a little bit about your swap sizing uh, compared to RAM? Are you running like half RAM swap size? Because we're I've been running some um, mm. higher end hardware just for swap, and that seems to work well. Yeah, it's, it's that's actually something that we also um, we had the same problem with uh, swap sizing, and um, um, it's kind of we it's, uh, the interesting realization was that. Um, this is dependent upon not only on your memory size, I mean, because your memory size would uh, primarily determine your working size, your right? application size, right? So that kind of has a uh, factor gets factored into the calculation. But also, what's really important is how fast your swap device is, right? If you have like really slow hard disk, right? There's no point in having 16 gigabytes of swap, right? It's just that's gonna take forever, right? But if you have like really fast NVMe, and you know that's gonna run out real fast. And the thing is that if your uh, backing device is really fast, even if you have, say, 20 gigabytes of swap, the system might still be really responsive and usable and might be just making better use of memory, right? Um, so it is dependent upon... Uh, the other part is that if you run out of swap, right, then the system behavior changes abruptly at that point, right? When the point you run out of swap space, right, or anonymous memory management goes to kind of messy, right? I mean, or, or logics break down. So you don't want to run out of swap. Um, so that's basically what uh, we are trying to do. Um, that, you know, size it based on the uh, backing device size and try to make it never run out. Unless something is going wrong, then we're going to kill something which is using too much. Hi, um, I also have a question on uh, swap. When you, uh, how can you make uh, swap available to uh, other applications other than the main application? Oh, yeah, so um, C group two, I think you can do that in C group one too, but it's kind of uh, tricky. On C group two, you have a memory dot swap dot max. So you, you just set it to zero on your main workload, and the main workload is not gonna have access to swap. So you can you know, tell who, who uses swap that way. I see, thank you. So I had a quick question about uh, the startup times on those. I know you had you were looking for the 10 uh, uh, bandwidth of when they both reached growing to it, but I noticed there was a slight difference Ooh. in some of the startup times on those web servers. Yeah, it's just, you know, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, I, I was just curious if that was... Yeah, yeah it's just, you know, the tests are, um, um, are, yeah, these are all based on um, like a real traffic in our production yeah, okay. environment, so they're not, you know... Sure. Synthetic. And then one other question: uh, the machine learning stuff that you're talking about doing for this would that work eventually be upstreamed, or would that we, is that um, ever looked at to upstream that? We, sort we're of thing? we're still like uh, it's still like a concept. Yeah, yeah. Like we're still researching it, but um, it's and it's going to be upstream is, if it, it works. would be okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Just yeah. Hey there, great talk. Thank you. Um, so, are you measuring forward progress and just? preserving the workload for the secondary and tertiary, tertiary processes as well? Or are you only measuring workload and throughput and achieving what you want on the primary workload? Uh, I'm not sure I, I follow. So say with a web server, you're getting 
10,000 requests per second, oh. right? And that's working well, and we can all imagine how to measure that. Mm. How are you measuring that for things besides something like a web server? Beside the web servers? Yeah, so like if you have those secondary services like a Chef or Puppet, like you okay. mentioned, Ooh, okay. how would you, how would yeah. Facebook say determine that those are making forward progress? And what are some examples that you know you've tried to preserve? Sure. Um, so for uh, protection from tax part, it's fairly um, clear, and it's for us, right? Either the system is stable or not, right? Um, if the Chef like uh, fails to run for two days, the system is not healthy, right? So as long as these things however slow they may be, run at sustainable rate, um, then you know it's considered healthy and we're okay with that. Or like there are some like a uh, monitoring software running um, and we don't miss data points, then we are happy, right? So th like the criteria there are fairly clear for us. Um, but um, like one thing that I didn't mention um, in to-dos, give me a sec, it's, um, um, yeah. So we are trying to uh, experiment with this thing. So meaning that we want to uh, load a low priority but meaningful work uh, next to a main workload which is latency sensitive so that we can you know push up utilization of uh, each machine a lot higher and you know in that case you know we now have to define what's the uh, you know meaningful amount of work um, and you know we are now trying to quantify that right that, that kind of leads into the mm -hmm. secondary question was mm -hmm. if you guys have been testing this on servers that are sort of dual workload right? Um, something where you might have a, a web server that's very important, or mm. maybe a web server is not a great example. Those tend to be very specialized. But maybe two high priority workloads that are co tenant. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you've done experiments with that. We want to get there, but we are not there yet. Okay, so thank you. One other question. Um, for is there a reason why you guys wanted to go for like not the container approach for all this? Oh, so, this is all container approach. So this is all. Yeah, yeah. In what regard? Um, what do you mean? So your your work for C Group was to run C Group on a container, and oh, then so, that container um, on hardware. Yeah, or? yeah. So um, like all these applications are running uh, on something called Tupperware, which is our like internal proprietary yeah. container implementation. Sure. And so all the C Group configuration, everything like is you know done through that container and. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious: is there any work that is done? At the C group level, on the host machines, then as well. Uh, I'm not following. So this this tax would occur at in the container level, and you have a, all your. Oh, so the, the tax is at the system level. Um, our containers are only carrying the workloads. In in this application. Got it. So yeah. your okay, but are you doing any C group stuff on the container level too? Inside the container. You yeah. Mean? Right. So are are you containerizing per application or with per application? Done? And um, we are also there are use cases where um, they subdivide resource control inside containers. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, there's cool rabbit hole there. <laughs> I'd always been led to believe that it was not a good idea to swap on mm. SEDs, uh, SSDs because. Mm. Um, the workload would be too high. You'd wear out this one spot sure, in the yeah, SSD, yeah, and it yeah, would yeah. fail. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of quite surprised to see that you're doing it. Do you, do you only do it on NVMe um, SSDs? So like it's actually um, kind of interesting there. Like the thing is that if you think about like um, effective use of swap, right? What's the, what would be a good use of swap, right? It's the putting away cold memory, right? So if you're only putting away your cold memory, right, you're not doing like active write and reads that much, right? You incur um, a lot of writes when you're swapping out hot memory, right? Right. And that's not a healthy state to be in for a system, right? And we can monitor that with uh, memory pressure, right? So okay. yeah, that's that's our yeah. Thank you. Hi. I had um, two questions. One is to follow up to the gentleman before. So one was the you mentioned as part of your presentation that uh, uh, other container frameworks have this issue regarding controls and so on, and also the fact that this is actually very transparent. So I actually interpreted exactly like how he did. I was like, okay, this is just running on the raw system, and then you brought Tupperware and saying that's again orchestration, container orchestration, like. Okay. Uh, uh, so I was trying to uh, uh, do, understand 
what was the point that you were making before when you said um, uh, other uh, when you were running things under containers bef uh, uh, that was like Docker sure. versus doing it through Tupperware. What is the, the, the point that you were trying to uh, make earlier that maybe I missed? Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. so whether like the application is containerized or not mm -hmm. is not that interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Like looking up from the kernel yeah. side, right? I just look, I, what I see is just like these processes mm -hmm. you know, grouped together and I have to distribute resources, right? Yeah. So whether they are, you know, apps in, at higher level, a Docker container or a Tupperware container or just a random application or systemd service, um, it doesn't really matter to corner that much, right? Um, the only thing that I care about from a C group uh, standpoint is the hierarchy, the C group hierarchy layout and you know which process is where and how the configs are there on C group and Docker, you know, uh, you know, Kubernetes, Tupperware, they all just configure C group and that's what we um, work on. Okay. And the second question I had was regarding the, uh, uh, initially you said you tried the max and high and mm. then eventually switched to min and low. Uh, could you explain one more time why that was sure. better and? So, um, mm, okay. Um, so if you set a limit, right? Uh, let's say um, you have like a you have a pool of memory, right? That the system can use, right? And the the kernel, the memory management tries to make the best use of it. I mean, you know, within its means. Um, and let's say you cannot lock up, say, twenty percent of it, right? Just this, just kind of you cannot do that with twenty percent. Now the kernel has to work with eighty percent, right? If the kernel was doing a good job of managing memory, now the efficiency of memory usage would have dropped, right? Uh, but this is really simplified, right? So if you you know take it to extreme, right? If you like uh, lock ninety percent of things and the kernel can only manage ten percent, right? It cannot do the, you know any kind of optimization on the ninety percent of memory, right? So the point I'm trying to get to is that the more limits you put on the system the efficiency of resource utilization goes down, right? And the, the problem with high and max is that um, you set a limit somewhere, like um, here's the thing. Um, if you set it too low, right, uh, for tax, tax part is gonna be unhappy at some point, right? And we don't want that, the system is not healthy. And if it's at too high, right, um, it can affect the main workload. That's not happy either. So. Um, so you're gonna have to like push it down as much as you can while the while keeping the system still more or less uh, healthy, and that point um, is higher than what you really want it to be because you are by setting that you are reducing the total efficiency of the system. So if the system was oversubscribed to begin with, right? By doing that, you are just adding more work like load on the system. So that makes it kind of brittle. Are more 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 um, fragile. In contrast, right? If you say um, I want to protect this is important thing, um, I want to give more memory more readily to this guy. But if that guy really needs it, that can take it, right? Then the system has more flexibility while uh, implementing resource isolation. It can still you know give and borrow memory uh, uh, across that boundary. So the the boundary is just not as hard as as inflexible. And that kind of adds to the efficiency of the system. And it, it just comes out that our hard drive based, uh, based machines are just really like oversubscribed like, to the brim. So like if you make it worse by 10% 10, 10 or 5%, it's just gonna fall over. So you just cannot do that. So that's um, where it came from. A quick question about the oversubscription. When you say you run your machines slightly oversubscribed mm. with positive pressure for efficiency, are you referring to just the system slice? Or are you also referring to the workload where you maybe overload on the CPU because of IO weight? Um, I, I think um, I confused two things. Okay. Uh, one thing is that like um, when I said that the hard drive machines are oversubscribed nominally, it's not constantly oversubscribed, but there are these like, uh, uh, temporal events where the machine is oversubscribed. And at that point, you kind of have to you know, move resources around to keep the system up. Um, you cannot have hard boundaries. So that's um, what, what I meant um, at the first. And when I was talking about load shedding, um, like uh, uh, keeping uh, a machine fully running, um, it, it was a little bit of, um, 
it's a lot of simplification, but um, yeah, but um, yeah, the, the goal is fully utilizing, utili utilize, utilizing, utilizing a given resource, right? Like think about like when you are doing a parallel build, like um, how many J number do you use, right? Slightly higher than your number of CPUs or maybe twice, sure. right? What you try to do is that you don't want to use thousand when you have four CPUs. That doesn't make any sense. It's just gonna use hold more memory and just more contention, right? But you still wanna have a slightly more work than the machine is capable of consuming, so that it's always occupied. And and what resource pressure can give you is that telling you how much that over subscription is, right? So it can tell you that um, I am loaded hundred ten like hundred ten percent, meaning that I only have m adding uh, in a simplified way ten percent extra overhead while the whole machine is always busy. Um, so it kind of gives you like how much you are overloaded. Like so, your J is not thousand. Your J can be you know four point two when you have four CPUs. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of what I was getting to. So an example of like running a parallel build. Let's say you're just running on a physical machine and you just mm -hmm. do you know you use a rule of thumb, like you say maybe I do J plus one or two J or whatever. When you have these tools, how does how you think change? So um, we don't like have that, but like um. If we imagine how it would do, like let's say it can just um, when is when a job finishes, when um, or rather let's say um, when a job finishes and a make is about to make the decision to launch a new job or wait for the next one to to stop, right? You can look at the pressure number. Let's say it's above uh, 100 or, or above um, 200 percent. So it's you know. It has twice more work than you know it can consume, but there's no point in starting starting more, right? So you can just wait. Um, but you know it doesn't have to be 200 percent. Like um, it can be like you know you can target for like 110 percent um, if you're depending on your granularity. And what that gives you is that you can still keep the machine fully loaded, but only add like a really small amount of extra latency or resource consumption because you're having too many work. Okay. So, yeah. So what happens if you temporarily borrow, mm. a process temporarily borrows more than its minimum and pressure increases so that it now should be pushed back down to its minimum? minimum. Yeah. How is that reclaimed? That was the kills, right? It's just the kill, just yeah. the only way to reclaim. I was saying, how is, yeah. it, how is it possible to reclaim outside of killing? There isn't yeah, way, right? Kill. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this or like, swap, I guess, right? Is the other option if you have sure, swap available. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, um, like the thing is, you can push it beyond what swap can contain, yeah, right? Yeah. And at that point, the main workload will start suffer, start to suffer, and then then Umdi kicks in and. Yeah. But with with both of those, does it let you? So if I if I allow the swap, will that essentially reclaim by pushing it to swap? If I if I allow that mm. process to have swap. But it should be pushed down to its yeah, minimum memory, yeah, yeah. so it will. Yeah. So it will. Yeah, yeah. It could survive without the OOM. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you very much.